Amen. I can't think of a more appropriate song to take us into communion. How he laid himself down for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's communion time. This is a time where we pause and reflect on how um, great a sacrifice God made coming in the person of Jesus Christ, wrapping himself in flesh and coming from a state of perfection into a state of imperfection, coming from the heavenly realm into the natural realm, piercing the infinite and coming into a finite state for you and I. It's an incredible time. I pray that you have been able to get ready by grabbing some symbols there from your home. We're going to start by just praying over those, and then we're going to take communion together. Come on, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time to be able to pause and reflect on what you did on the cross. Thank you that your blood has never lost and will never lose its power. And so we ask that you would help us in this moment to reflect, to understand, and to comprehend what communion means, Lord, to commune with each other and to commune with you. We ask that you would bless the symbols as we partake in this time together. Lord, and we'll be so careful to give your name all the praise, honor, and glory that it deserves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, took the bread and broke it, said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat of it. And in like manner, took the cup, the fruit of the vine, said, this is my blood shed for the remission of your sins. Take, drink ye all of it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a great spot to say hallelujah right where you are. We are so honored to be able to meet with you virtually. And even though we're meeting virtually, we are firm believers that we still need to be the friendly church that God has called us to be. And so as I'm sneaking a peek over, I'm seeing some phones that aren't open quite yet where we can't see them just yet. I see you there, uh, Sister Jeanette. I see you, uh, Kathy and Rick, uh, with those closed uh, cameras. And so I want you to prepare yourself by opening up your camera right now and just beginning to wave. This is meet and greet time where we can open up our cameras, wave at each other, and say, how you doing? Look in and see, kind of flex on them, let them see that you're still hanging in there. You're still, by the grace of God, sound and healthy and able to just wave at one another. Come on, there you go. I see it. You can send some chats. For those of us that are joining uh, by Facebook, we ask that you would just send a shout out in Facebook. Let us know who you are, where you are. Uh, just take a few moments and say hello. Take a few moments and talk to each other there. And as we do that, we're going to prepare ourselves to head right into the word for today. So thank you again on behalf of the College Park Church family, my wife Carmen, myself, our leadership team. We love you and thank you for joining in with us on today. Invite a friend for Tuesday and next Sunday so that we can continue to share the word of God and get the word out about what's happening here. All right. Now, we are moving right in to our time of sharing today. Um, we have been talking what uh, last week I shared that it's kind of grown into a 
a series organically uh, that started on Father's Day with uh, Noah um, uh, as, as father. And the underlying concept there was uh, favor in fearsome times. And uh, we are now looking at not only Noah in that first week, but we're spending last week and this week at least talking about Daniel and some of the incredible things that he did. And then we're going to follow up with some time from Job. Now, the reason why we're doing this is found in part, at least, in the book of Ezekiel. Let's put that up really quickly and let's read through that. Ezekiel 14, 19 and 20 says, or if I send a plague into that land and pour out my wrath on it, through bloodshed, killing its people and their animals, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord. Even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save neither son nor daughter. They would save only themselves by their righteousness. And so that became a launch point first on Father's Day talking about Noah. And then from there, We are moving right into looking at Daniel and Job. And so that's kind of the overarching point. And last week, we started by talking about Daniel and spending some time with him and seeing what we could pull from him that would help us understand this concept of favor in fearsome times. Uh, We want to make sure that with all that's happening in our lives, all that's happening in our communities, and all that's happening in this nation and in this world, that we understand these are definitely fearsome times, but we are called to walk in such a way where we can still have the favor of God. Last week, we spent some great time defining favor, understanding that it's not to be confused with putting God in a genie, uh, genie's lamp and just rubbing on it and expecting him to give us any desire, any time we want, but that we would be able to walk in such a way where, number one, he notices us, he calls us out, much like he called out Noah, Daniel, and Job, and then we would walk in favor no matter what circumstances bring our way, and this is not an easy task. Believe me when I say it. And so we start with looking at Daniel last week and seeing the fact that he was under some tremendous change as a very young man. He'd grown up and now he's been in essence kidnapped as a part of the first uh, uh, individuals who were taken into Babylon and he is now facing some critical things. Here's what he's facing. He's facing having his name changed. We knew him as Daniel. Then they started calling him some other things. Uh, His friends, we knew them under their names. Then they started calling them something else. You should be careful when someone wants to call you something that you know you are not. You know God created you and I to be what he created us to be. So when someone wants to rename you, you got to be careful about that. Then who was in control of their life as far as from a natural standpoint had absolutely changed for Daniel and his family, as they are part of the individuals who were the first to be taken into Babylon from their homeland, the, the, not only their names changed, but the control center changed in the natural sense. There's no longer uh, uh, the king that they're looking to there. They're now under the tutelage of Babylon. They're being uh, a totally rewritten, reprogrammed. We're going to read about this in just a moment. And then not only changed names and changed control, but changed God. Where they came from, the one and true living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the God. But now we're in Babylon, and there's a pagan culture that's in place. So things have definitely changed for Daniel in this particular setting. Much as we see around us, there is similar traits that we can look at. Not everyone calls on the God that we call on. Not everyone follows the word of God that we follow. Not everyone is seeking to be led by the Holy Spirit like we're seeking to be led by the Holy Spirit. Not everyone is praying to the same uh, uh, God that we are praying to. And so we have to find ourselves taking lessons from the Holy Scripture that we can apply to ourselves. Let's see what the book of Daniel in those first few Uh, scriptures in that first chapter of Daniel kind of helps us understand what he was up against. Let's see what it says. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These are carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. 
Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, right? We started this off with Noah as father, right? And you can go online and grab uh, the sermon summary from that week. Then we went into last week and looked at favor and fearsome times, looking at Daniel and his determination. And we saw the first three things of about six that I want to call out today. Now, here is a great pause point where you can come back to me, and I want you to just, I'm going to just get you to pat me virtually on my back, because instead of doing six or seven last week, we just broke them up into two. Praise the Lord. Do you see that growth right there? Do you see that's not trying to cram it all into one so we could just have an A and a B for this lesson right here? That, that's, a, that's right there. That's worthy of dancing and twirling and shouting before the Lord right there. So we could just shave off another 28 to 38 minutes of the service by doing that wisdom right there. And so this week, we're going to carry on from last week with favor and fearsome times. This is technically the third sermon of this series with Daniel's determination, part B. Now, last week, you'll recall, we used James chapter 1, verse 12, as what I'm going to call our jump off uh, scripture. And I want to read that again to kind of set the tone so we can pick back up with where we were last week. And here's what it says. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So we had our first three points last week. This week, we want to continue by moving into point four of how godly favor comes. And so we're going to pick right up with looking at godly favor coming through point four, building credibility, building credibility. Daniel, the first chapter, verse 15 and 16 says as follows, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. So now let's talk about this for those that may be joining with us for the first time this week. Last week, we talked about this situation where Daniel had the challenge of eating the king's royal food that would have taken him out of alignment with his God and with his practices as far as how he was managing his eating and his life. And he had made a deal with the chief. He said, chief, if you would just give us what we need, we will be okay. The chief was a little bit concerned because he didn't want to get his head handed to him. These men were identified, these young men, again, somewhere between the age of 15 and 18, were identified as choice young men, that they, were, they had the aptitude, they had the capability, as we read. They were, they were the ones that should be working in the king's court. And so they were set to kind of have their, their, their new bachelor's degree, their undergraduate degree uh, in Babylonian studies. And so they were going to be put to the side for about two or three or so years to learn all the customs, to learn all the literature, to learn all the ways of Babylon. And in this process, they had the opportunity to eat whatever the king wanted to eat. They, they brought in all of the menu. They rolled it right out for them. And instead of them taking advantage of that, we established that last week, that they said, no, just let's do this a little different. Just give us vegetables and water. And what ended up happening was what they said actually took place. And by doing so, here's what they were able to do. They were able to build credibility. See, credibility comes by you and I being what we're called to be at all times. 
Remember the tremendous stress and strain. Now, I want to get this straight. It's not that these individuals were being beaten and into some sort of chattel uh, labor situation. It's not likely like that at all. If they're working in the king's court, it's a slightly different circumstance. And so while it wasn't necessarily the most physical pressure, a high, high pressure situation, what was going on for them instead is their spiritual boundaries. The boundaries that they set for themselves for following what God has called for them to follow were extremely tested Because now they're in a position where they can have and do anything that the king has set before them. Whatever that food was, whatever that drink was, they had the ability to do it. And by virtue of him saying that being David, I'm sorry, Daniel saying, listen, let's do vegetables and water only, some sort of deal like that. We can see just all the things that are left out, just staying right there with vegetables. He didn't even name some fruit. He just said vegetables and water. Right. And so here he called his shot. And here's what I mean when I say it. Remember that? Oh, I think it was Babe Ruth that gets up there and points towards a certain point, uh, 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 saying that basically when you throw this pitch, I'm about to go yard on you. I'm about to knock a home run on you. He called his shot and then he knocked it over the wall here. David called his shot when he asked him to feed him differently than everyone else and to see what he looked like. Because not only did they do it, but afterwards he came out looking fairer, came out looking in shape, probably got a little cleaner, got a little brighter, got everything that he needed, and it was able to build credibility. See, winning continually builds credibility. The question is for you and I, what do we call winning? For us, we have to be careful, as we talked a little bit about that last week, that we don't define winning as only getting what we want when we want it, only allowing for things to come our way that blesses us, that makes us feel good, that has us celebrating. But you and I win when we're able to, no matter what comes our way, no matter how the storms of life rage, no matter how things are going tipsy and topsy-turvy in our lives, that we can still stand fast and win even when it looks like you and I are losing. See, the win for us is different. The win for us is changing to, to holding on to God's unchanging hand. The win for us is making sure that everything that God has called for us to do, we continue to do. The win for us is walking like him, talking like him. The win for us is being a reflection of him. The win for us is us following what he said for us to follow continually, no matter what. See, the world's win, it means I have money. I have favor with man. I have the homes that I want. I have the cars that I want. I have the jewelry and the clothes and the things that I want that are material goods. A lot of those times, those are the wins for us. The fact that I'm not sick, the fact that I don't have a pronouncement over my life of some uh, uh, death, deathly illness or some sort of situation like that, those are the things that the world calls the win. You and I are challenged to ensure that we don't limit ourselves by classifying a win the same way the world classifies a win. Let's look at Romans 8 and 28. Some of us know this very well. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. If we had time, we would deep dive, but here's the bottom line of that scripture. Here's what Paul is trying to help us to understand. No matter what happens, if we are relying on God, whether I live, whether I die, I'm in God's hands. As long as I continue to do what he's called me to do, as long as I am following after his precepts, as long as I am following after his will, after his way, no matter what happens in life, he is the great conductor. He is the great orchestrator. He is the author and the finisher of everything that we walk through. And because of that, we can have faith, understanding that he knows what's going on. And so whether it looks like a win or it's not a win or whether it looks like a, a, a us coming up and getting further and faster ahead as man would decide it, instead we're saying, God, whatever you say is a win for us, that's the win that we want. Lord, whatever you say we're called to walk through, that's what we want to walk through. Lord, whatever you say we've got to go through, That's what we're going to go through because no matter what happens, it all works to the good. As long as I stay in him, uh, attached to his will, attached to his purpose for my life, 
We've got to build credibility no matter what's going on, that we're walking fearlessly in faith, believing that God is going to hold us. And even though it looks like we're losing, even though it looks like we're going down for the final time, we can hold to his unchanging hand and know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. All is all. All is all. Point number five, godly favor comes through not only building credibility, but having brains. Amen. This one might go down a little hard, but just bear with me for a second. Let's go to Daniel 1.17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Okay, here we go. There has to be a respect and a desire for getting knowledge. My, oh, my. Sometimes I'm sad to say that we are stuck in our, um, how can I say this? We're stuck in a rudimentary um, a, a phase of, of learning the things of God. I was uh, doing some study this week, and one of the things that I'm praying that we're going to have some fun with, we're getting ready to go into our Bible study series um, I can't think of the name of the book right now that we're going to be using. Oh, the Bible, the story, the story Bible. We're going to start that here in a couple of weeks. You'll be hearing more about that. Uh, and, and one of the things that amazes me is the underlying history. Like a lot of times in the Bible, the scripture doesn't specifically articulate what time in history things are happening. That's not central uh, to what was intended to be communicated. But there is a tapestry that is there that comes right alongside that helps us not only to understand better what's happening, but I don't know about you, it's good for me to see that archaeologically, scientifically, that we can see evidence for scriptures that when we have faith, we're not called to have a blind faith. We're not called to walk in complete ignorance. There is enough here for us to be able to understand that the reason we have belief in God is a sound one. You got to understand what we're saying here. There's got to be a willingness to understand and to learn and to be knowledgeable for ourselves individually. We can't get by on what our parents gave us. We can't get by on what we learned in in a, a Sunday school setting, those cute sayings that got us through, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray my soul the Lord to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to, yes, you know it. Quite well. We can't just stay right there. We can't just stay at blessing our food before we eat, right? We can't just leave off right there. There has to be a willingness for you and I to continually dig into the Word, to understand the mysteries of the Word of God, to have God continually pour out Himself to us, that as we understand more and more about His will and His way, we understand more about how to apply it practically in our lives so that we can have the brains that are required to have faith favor. So many of us are in these trying times. We don't know which way we're going. We don't know if we're coming, if we're going. We don't know if it's up, if it's down, if we're left or right, because we are not rooted and grounded in the things of God. So when all the chaos breaks out in our lives around us, both near and far, we don't quite know how to ground ourselves. Where is your true north? If your true north is just your feelings, you and I are out to lunch. We're going to have some problems. Let's go to Psalm 111, 7 through 10. We might even read a little bit more than that, but let's see. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts, his words, are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever and acted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Here it is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts, his word, his understanding, uh, have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. I don't know about you, but it says it plainly right there. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who follow his precepts 
have good understanding. That word precepts is just a fancy word that talks about his word. You and I have to make sure that we're continually diving in, that we're continually applying our intellect with our faith. Our faith is informed with our intellect. The two aren't mutually exclusive. They come together like peanut butter and jelly. They are a package deal. One complements the other and improves the other. And so if we only stay at a rudimentary level, then as life progresses, as issues get more advanced, as circumstances challenge you and I, we find ourselves in the unenviable position to not know what to do. And then by not knowing what to do, we're subject to be tossed to and fro by the waves of life. And when we're tossed to and fro, not only does that cause a problem for us as individuals, it causes problems in our family, it causes problems in our community, causes problems in our states, causes problems in our nation, causes problems in this world, and then we are not bringing heaven to earth as Christ taught us to. It is an ongoing challenge that the church universal made up of individuals who look suspiciously like you and I has to be called to engage our mind. Spend a little less time on some of the things that eat away at your time and spend more time at the things that will help you be able to glorify God no matter what's going on in our lives. We've got to have favor come through not only building credibility, but having brains. And then finally, godly favor comes through better. <laughs> Let's read Daniel 1, 19 and 20. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. So they entered the king's service. Listen to what it says here. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the mag magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. Let's say that again. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Listen, I need you to understand this. The king of Babylon, the pagan society, brings in Daniel and his three boys, and he talks with them. Apparently, it wasn't just a quick five-minute exchange, because it said on several areas, as they discussed, he found them, hear this, the pagan king, the king of the world, the king who is not following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the king of the world engages with them, and his takeaway is they are 10 times better than any of the magicians, right, and the enchanters. So in other words, the people who used illusion to try to make things happen, who tried to, to try to use magic to make things happen. In other words, they, they used trickery and, and they tried to come off as knowledgeable, but really they didn't have sound wisdom. Uh, they were 10 times better. It would have been good if they were just better. But what he said is they were 10 times better than the magicians and the enchanters. Here's what we've got to understand. God's way is always superior to man's way. This is what this better means. It's what we talk about in our kind of subthought when we're describing ourselves. We always use this term better together better together. This better thing, listen, our bodies are wired. God is so incredible. You ever cut yourself, then you just stop the bleeding. If everything is healthy, your, your, your body will, your blood will coagulate and it'll stop the bleeding. And then over time, that will heal. God has programmed inside of us from a physical standpoint, the ability to just get better. The body wants to. If you keep things pretty much in a, in a, in a homeostatic way and, and, and balanced and so forth, things will get better generally, right? So now we have to take a cue from him and make sure that in every area of our life, our desire is to get better and to be better and to do better. 
So here, when the king compared these fellas to the magicians and the enchanters, he had to call out readily, listen, you know what? <laughs> these guys are 10 times what these other uh, uh, um, uh, nut jobs are. <laughs> they are just fakers. These guys are the real deal. You and I, can people say that about us? Can people say that we're 10 times better than the nonsense that we see on the television? Can they say that we're 10 times better than the nonsense that we see uh, present in our communities? Can they say that we are 10 times better than individuals who are charged with leading us in various capacities? Can they say, can your co-worker say that you're 10 times better? I'm not talking about in a, in a, 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 under, a, 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 a shady kind of way, like you're trying to build a culture a, against your supervisor. But if you happen to serve a supervisor that has some problems and some challenges and they just aren't quite right, can your co-workers look at how you're dealing with that situation and say, that person is 10 times better? Can your family say you're 10 times better? times better? Can your spouse say you're 10 times better? We have to be such that no matter what's happening in our lives, the world will see from us that we are 10 times better than any challenge that we come up against. We are 10 times better than what the enemy would throw our way. We are 10 times better than the nonsense that we see around us. That has to be our way towards favor. Why would you want God to bless mess? Why would you want God to bless ineffectiveness? Why would you want God to bless being less than? Excellence speaks for itself. When you go through every situation and you continually apply the word and you continually have people see that you're, you're building credibility and you continually have people see that you're operating with wisdom, with, with, a, with a, a, a peace that passes all understanding and a joy unspeakable, and that they see the outcomes in your life, even when it looks to them like you're losing, you still handle things in a totally different way. There's something different about Daniel, I think that's why he was called out. Now, here's what I don't want to do. Sometimes we will make um, individuals in the historicity of the Bible so lofty that we say, well, that was Daniel. I can't do that. The reason in part why it's there is to help be a guide for you and I. Don't make individuals that we read about and learn about in Scripture so lofty that you say, well, I could never do that. When we look at how Jesus walked because we're called to walk like him, some folks will say, well, he was God in flesh. Listen, there is a reason why he showed himself. There is a reason why he came and put on flesh. There is a reason why he walked on this earth so that we could see what he was doing and we could emulate him and be Christians. <laughs> right? That's what it is. Those who are Christ-like followers of him. Don't make anyone that we are called to glean from so lofty that you and I walk away from the very challenge that they set. We are called to live into it. It's going to be easy? No. It's going to always happen perfectly? No way. It's going to be some bumps and bruises along the way. You better believe it. But we have to be better. As we prepare to close, there has to be an, a commitment on our part. There has to be and understanding. There has to be the ability to understand that godly favor comes through boundaries, being benevolent, having the correct behavior, and then building credibility, and operating with smarts, having brains. Then when it's all said and done, being better. Listen, you and I have a better option through Christ. It's a better option than money, better option than fame, better option than possessions, better option than having everything that our simple mind can desire. We've got to place our hearts and minds right where they need to be, where God is. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. His righteousness, all these things will be added. He was talking about not having to be worried about what you would wear and what's going on with your body and what you would eat in context. If we just keep our focus on him, that's how we gain favor in fearsome times. 
Both Noah and Daniel give us some incredible tools to work with. I'm undecided if we're going to have some fun next week with Daniel because I'd be remiss if I didn't. I mean, there's some goodies in the book of Daniel. I, I, I might just squeeze out one more. So you just hang out with us. We might squeeze out one more. We'll see. You come next week and see if we'll go to Job or if we'll hang out one more time with Daniel. There are some interesting things that kept happening to him as he continued in this manner. And you and I are called to pull out from them what it is that God would have us to walk in, no matter what's happening around us. Even when we find ourselves on the outside looking in, there's a new God. They've changed our names. They've changed who's in control. They've changed who the center uh, uh, belief system is. We still are called to walk according to the Bible. Come on, I want you to think about a few things as we prepare to pray. Um, our application challenge, first of all, is to get involved with local government and the WAVE campaign. I got some fun feedback from one of our members, so I'm just going to say it this way. Ladies, make sure you're careful when and where you use the WAVE campaign, <laughs> right? Sometimes you'll get you some unwanted attention, so you got to be wise in that. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's amazing, but just make sure, you know, um, you're using that in the right way. But yes, get involved with your local government and uh, the WAVE campaign. We're going to continue with that. But in addition to that, as we prepare to pray, I want us to be thinking about what it means to have favor in fearsome times. These really are fearsome times. This is a challenging season that we're operating in. It is just incredible how many different directions we can go in. And as we talk about end times, I am not, you know, one of these that, you know, inappropriately harp on um, so many different things. So many different generations can talk about the end times from the apostles forward. Um, we're in the last days. But um, as Bishop Dixon used to say, we're closer than we've ever been <laughs> to the last days and the final days before Jesus' return. And we need to be ready by walking in favor in spite of the fearsome times that we find ourselves in. So where are you? Where are you in this discussion? Are you like Noah, Daniel, and Job? Or are you tossed to and from? Depending on what happens, for some of us, we're finding we're easily tossed to and from. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for challenging us, helping us to understand all that's happening in the life of Noah and, and Daniel and Job as it relates to favor and fear sometimes. Lord, we ask that you would help us to apply this to our lives, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. Lord, we ask that you would help us to walk through each one of these elements and look critically, analytically at ourselves first before we look anywhere else and see, are we doing those things that would garner favor in these fearsome times? Lord, and then as we do that, Lord, help us to make the proper connections with individuals who would help us continue to walk out the various challenges that would help us in shaping who we are and whose we are so that as we get better at walking in, uh, in favor, Lord, you would be pleased and you would be glorified. People would be attracted to you through us. Prepare us now, Lord. Help us to go away challenged and ready to take action against what you shared on this morning. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. And we honor you for it. In your son Jesus' name, we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us today. Listen, don't forget this Tuesday at 7 p.m. we'll be having our Bible study and just time of check in with each other. And then next Sunday we'll be continuing in the Favor and Fearsome Time series. God bless you and have an incredible week.